Well, welcome to the professional wellness session, Miss Julie Brown. It has been so long, so long since I have seen you. So I'm glad to see your face. I know it's really great to see you, Constance. I'm, I miss I miss being able to sort of have these little conversations with you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I remember um, we would talk forever when I would babysit your oldest, and mm -hmm. when you would get home, we would just have conversations about just all the things of the world. Yeah, mm -hmm. I remember that. And my oldest now is twenty. <laughs> so. <laughs> makes me feel old <laughs> <laughs> that um, is that yeah. is wow I know to think that yeah he's 20 it just it goes by so quickly mm -hmm. yeah it's like but it's it's nice to be able to like still be here and see it and to um sort of look back on it and it gives you a whole new appreciation I think of just with my other two, it gives me a total appreciation to maybe soak in the moments because it, it doesn't seem like it goes by quickly, but it really does. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I remember when um that was the first time I believe that I'd ever um been with a baby so young. And <laughs> that was <laughs> but it was it was it was wonderful. Yeah. Oh. Those were sweet times. So I met, we met over 20 years ago. Yeah. I was still in, I think I was still in college. You were, yeah. I mm -hmm. was still in college and started working at the Y um, and you were my boss. And that was, that was, I mean, when I think back now, I was so young and eventually was one of the supervisors and the head teacher in a parent mornings out program. And I'm like, I was like, barely 20 and I remember <laughs> those families I remember the experiences and it was a great time yeah I remember yeah I I think that's probably that was my first sort of adventure in the nonprofit world and I think having that connection to families mm -hmm. and really like being with the staff um I think sort of inspired me to go back into that world for, you know, after I went mm -hmm. into the for-profit for a little bit. So, yes. So yeah. now you are human in human resources. You are a chief human resource specialist or what's the, what's the title? <laughs> um, chief HR officer. So okay. we call it HRO. So my job entails just um, overseeing the whole HR function for a nonprofit organization here out, just outside of Boston. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how did you get into that after working um, at the Y? And I know before the Y, you had worked, and I can't remember, I want to say Blockbuster, but I don't. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I worked at Blockbuster, and then um, that job, I did some um some training, like some uh, new management trainings for, for Blockbuster. And then um, I got a little burnt out because I had to travel for trainings. Um, and after a while, I thought, you know what, I kind of want to be home on the weekends. I want to be, <laughs> be, you know, enjoying my weekends and then not suddenly getting home and then doing a turnaround of 24 hours and possibly being, you know, out again. Um, so I was volunteering at the Y and then um, quit my job and decided <laughs> I'm going to figure it out. You know, like most people sort of, I don't really know what I want to do yet, but I'm going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And um, ended up getting hired by the YMCA and sort of grew into a director level role there. Um, and it was, it was great. I think it was great being able to work with families, plan activities and do different things. Um, so that was, you know, really great opportunity. And I think it was, it also sort of gave me, um, I think that drive I had, I went to school to teach and I okay. didn't really pursue that. Um, I did it for a little bit and then sort of fell into other roles and did other things, but that sort of gave me the drive to want to go back and work in some way with children and families again. Oh, okay. Okay. That's nice. That's nice. So thank you for agreeing to engage in this conversation about wellness um, as a professional. Um, because I think that um, 
so many times we have our own experiences and work and personal life. And I don't think that it is discussed enough how it may impact us in our professional careers. Mm -hmm. So as we go through different transitions and while individuals can um, express their their concerns or their 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 sadness or whatever the the word is, um, depending on what's going on, it's not always thought about. Wow, this can have an impact on your career field. Yeah. So thank you for agreeing to engage in this conversation about wellness. You're welcome. I and I think it's a good conversation to have because I um have had the opportunity to experience it for both sides, right? So in HR, you know, we often have to deal, you know, when employees come to us and they have concerns or they have issues, um, or if they're not feeling well and they do have a chronic illness, or, you know, if they're struggling, you know, with their physical health or whether it be their mental health, um, we sort of, you know, work with them. And, you know, I think and it's going to sound harsh, but I think, you know, many years working on HR on that side of the house, um, you sort of have this very business mindset about it. Right. And some and a lot of organizations sort of see it as, you know, it's you just process the paper, do it and manage it and that's it. Um, but then on the flip side of that, I think, you know, I was diagnosed 13 years ago with cancer and, you know, I'm a a, a cancer, I'm still in treatments, cancer patient, and I've been fortunate enough to, you know, still be here, but I got to see it from the other side. Mm -hmm. And so it's given me like a whole new um, sort of vision and like empathy for people who are struggling, you know, not just with physical, you know, um, health, you know, issues in the workplace, but mental health and just all the different things. It's given me that perspective to be able to see it from both sides, which I think has been eye opening. But I also think it really helps when I'm dealing with those things because I can see it, you know, how do you manage it from this, you know, as the employer, but then all, how do you manage it and take into consideration what the employee may be feeling? Yeah. Yeah. That is such a unique experience being able to, and understanding the different layers to it. Mm -hmm. So what was it, what was it like for you to be on the other end? when you received your diagnosis and going through treatment and then having to, um, I guess, uh, rely, I don't know if rely is the right word, but going through HR with any leave that you needed to take. I think, well, at first, I think because I've seen, unfortunately, what some organizations have done, which, you know, isn't always the best practice, you know, what they do to employees, you know, so I have seen how, you know, you have an illness, you report it, and then they sort of treat you like a number and they say, okay, well, you know, you get so many X weeks of leave, so many, you know, so much time off, this is what we're co- we'll cover, this is how we'll support you, and that's it. Mm-hmm. So I think initially when I was diagnosed, um, it was a struggle because I think I had some shame which is like, you know, you, you, you're diagnosed with cancer. It's like, you got to focus on, you know, your treatments and stuff and, and getting better. But at the same time, I had this thing where I thought, oh my goodness, when I, if I share this at work, what are people going to think? Are they going to think I'm lazy? Are they, is it going to impact that Julie's not going to pull her fair share of the work? You know, here she is. And, and it, the reality was when I was diagnosed, I had literally started at an organization. I was there for, at that point for like three or four months. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, yeah. oh my goodness, they don't really have the opportunity to, you know, see my full potential. They haven't seen what I've done. You know, how are they going to treat me? And so initially I didn't want anybody to know. And I thought I'm going to try to work out this whole, you know, chemo, you know, if I have surgery, maybe I just take some vacation days and, you know, is that going to be realistic and how am I going to manage that? Um, but initially it was just a lot of embarrassment, shame, and then worry about my job. Like, you know, and I, and not, I don't think it wasn't just the financial aspects. It was, you know, I was pretty young in my career at the time because my cancer diagnosis came at a time when, um, you know, I was 32 years old and pretty young. And I still thought in my mind, there's so many things I want to do with my career. How is this going to impact me? how am I going to, you know, be able to get to the level professionally that I want to get to, but also have to manage this illness. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was, it was pretty difficult, I think. And I think at the time, 
I only told my boss and then the VP of HR at the time. And I said, I don't want anybody to know. I'm going to be out on these days. I'm going to work from <laughs> chemo. I'm going to do all these things, but I don't want anybody to know where I'm at. Cause I just so didn't want pity. I didn't want anybody mm-hmm. feeling bad for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think at the time I was still processing the diagnosis so I was trying to figure out what does this mean for me? What does this mean for my family? Um, you know, how's it going to impact my day to day? And so I just didn't even know if people knew about it, how I was going to engage in those kind of conversations. So there were a lot of different aspects, like so many emotions ran through my mind when I was initially diagnosed. And I think it, I think it also helps me like when someone comes in and I can see they're sort of struggling to share it, they have an illness or something is going on. It, you know, really helps me sort of, you know, um, and I'm now at the point 13 years out where I'm pretty open about it. Cause it's one of the things I've learned for my wellness and for my mental health is I have to be open about it and talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, because I also have to set strict boundaries about how how that plays into my job and how much energy can I give certain areas. And I have to be, you know, self-aware and transparent about those things. And so I can see when employees come to me and they, you know, they're dealing with something, you know, I'm open to share, you know, I've been through it. I may not understand your experience, but here's my experience. Mm -hmm. So if you're struggling with these things, I can understand it. Let's talk about it. Um, But it does give you a whole new perspective when you, when you're the one sitting on the other side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, being able to understand, as you said, all of the obstacles in your mind, emotionally, mentally, and trying to figure out what does this mean for me professionally? How is this impacting um, me professionally and in me overall and all of those things. So when did you give yourself permission to breathe? Because that sounds like that, that would be difficult to <laughs> breathe when it's, okay, yeah. wait a minute, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then they're not going to know. And only this select people will know. And I'm managing this. And I'm also keeping this private, which is your choice. And you're, you're yeah, you know, absolutely So how did you manage that? And how did you really take that time to just breathe? I think when I look back, I really don't know why I did it. Um, You know, just being completely honest, I think I'm a type A personality. So when something happens, I'm like, let's get an action plan in place. And I think, you know, when I was diagnosed, I just wanted to know, okay, what are the next steps? What do we need to do? What do I need to do to get done and and get out, you know, get on the other side of this, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And um. I think it was probably maybe a year or two later where I actually took a breath and said, okay, I've done all this, you know, um, and now I need to figure out how do I take care of myself and how Mm -hmm. do I talk about it? And if this is going to be my new normal, what do I need to do to make sure that I'm, you know, taking care of myself, prioritizing my family, prioritizing, you know, my mental health, my physical well-being, you know, um, prioritizing a partner, you know, prioritizing everything. I think I just had to sort of sit down and say, here's what I need. Here's what I have to do. But it took about a year, two years. And I think that, you know, it, there wasn't sort of this formula. I think everybody has, you know, their own sort of journey. Mm -hmm. And I think my journey was, I had to just get through the physical components of it. Um, I also at the time went through a divorce. (laughs) So I think, you know, Mm -hmm. I think for me also, I know that some people working while they're, you know, sick is not something that they want to do. And I think everyone is different. And so I don't, you know, I tell people you have to do what's best for you. Um, for me, I knew that I needed to keep up as much of a normal, like life as possible, like going to work was my norm. Doing that, you know, was also in some way, it was avoiding dealing with it. And I think I learned that later was yeah. that I was trying to be so busy <laughs> that mm-hmm. I didn't want to deal with, you know, a failing relationship. I didn't want to deal with, um, you know, the cancer. I didn't want to deal with, you know, how it was going to impact work. And I think I just pushed on. And then I came to a point where it was just too much. And I, you know, had to say, we got to put a hold here. We have to recognize what are we going to do? What what are the steps that I need to take to be the best version of myself for myself and my kids? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're, what you're talking about too, with the, the remaining active, it's a, I think it's a point that 
I don't know if many think about this, that when when we're considering how it may impact you as a professional, when you have a major um, medical diagnosis um, that you receive, is that, okay, now I have to make sure that I am proving that this is not going to impact me yeah. in my um, in my work. And mm -hmm. it's important to have someone like you to give that assurance that, yeah. hey, you've got to figure out what works for you and being able to understand that, yes, everybody's journey is different. I understand these aspects. I understand just going, 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 and then later realizing, wait a minute, now I need to take care of myself. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. I think, you know, because I think some people, you know, I know other cancer patients and other people with chronic illnesses have said, I just can't work. I got to focus all my energy on this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's okay, too. I think everyone has to recognize. And I think this whole journey has made me realize that you have to recognize what are your priorities, um, you also have to recognize setting boundaries, like, you know, mm -hmm. working and having, you know, being thinking about wellness as a professional is that I have to set boundaries. Like I have to know that a certain time I sort of have to check out from work and I have to spend this time doing this with my family. Cause you know, mm -hmm. I think the first step for me was sort of prioritizing where does work fall? Where does family fall? Where does, you know, I, I, that, you know, probably about a few years after, you know, my cancer diagnosis, I, um, about a year and a half after that, I met, you know, my current partner and he's amazing. And I had mm -hmm. to recognize like how much energy and time can I give that and how much energy and time do I have for work? Mm -hmm. And, you know, here are my priorities, my kids, my partner, and then work, you know, and mm -hmm. it was sort of really pri figuring out what was the most important things to me. And then taking the time to set the boundaries around, you know, when I'm doing this, I'm not going to think about this, or, you know, I'm not going to focus on this. Mm -hmm. But then also learning how to be really sort of honest and open about what I was struggling with or what I needed. Cause I think, you know, I grew up where you didn't really talk about sort of how you feel about things. You sort of held things on, you know, in, and I think that, you know, when you, I grew up thinking if you're honest about things, is that like, you know, showing that you're weak or that, you know, this is, you know, me not being able to do everything. And, you know, if you mm -hmm. can't do everything, you know, does that portray me as a failure? If I'm not perfect as a mom, I'm not perfect at work. I'm not yeah. perfect in my relationship. Um, so I think a lot of that was also about recognizing, you know, that it's not about weakness. It's about, you know, it, things happen. Nobody can be perfect and juggle everything. And I think, you know, I had to recognize that. I also had to recognize that what I needed and what I wanted to say, I had to be honest about it with people, you know? So like when I started that new relationship, I had to say, look, here are my priorities. Mm -hmm. It's nothing against you, but you have to recognize that this is, you know, where I'm in life, you know, that I have cancer. Mm -hmm. It's a lot to take on. You know, I'm a mom with, you know, two kids at that point. Um, you know, I also want to be successful in my career. And so you, you have to, you know, I think, you know, the, that was something I had to be upfront about from the get go. Um, but I think having a chronic illness, ha you know, and working and, you know, juggling all these things, it's made me realize that I have to really advocate for myself. Mm -hmm. I have to be, you know, open about communication and clearly define what I need, what I don't want. Um, and then also set those boundaries with everyone, whether it be work, whether it be, you know, um, in the advocacy world with cancer groups and saying, look, I have to take off some time to focus on myself and my family. Um, and then also knowing that feeling guilty in those things, it's okay to feel that way. Yeah. You know, I used to have a lot of shame about that. And I thought, no, it's okay to feel guilty. You know, we're not all going to be able to balance these things and do them on our own. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, in, in giving yourself that grace, mm -hmm. because you had a lot of things happening, almost like a domino where mm -hmm. you get your diagnosis. And I still remember receiving, um, when I received the email and I was, in the movie theater and oh. I was I was checking my my email and and it's because you I mean it's something you really never expect um yeah. but you're dealing with your diagnosis and then you're going through a divorce and then you meet um someone else 
and then everything else in between and also being a mom yeah and balancing all of that and giving yourself that grace and that space to really um experience all of the emotions while yeah. also managing your career yeah and I think that you know I think as women even without all those other things I think when you're a working mom you already it's innately like it's in our nature we feel guilty like we just feel guilty like oh my gosh my house isn't clean <laughs> or you know mm -hmm. this isn't I didn't get to this today or you know the kids have all mm -hmm. these things and am I giving them enough attention or am I focusing too much on work you know I think we just naturally feel that way and so I, and I think that I just sort of pushed on a lot of times and just thought, okay, you know, we're going to do it. We're going to manage it, manage it. And then I get to a point where I'd realize I can't manage it. I really needed to say something and, you know, you know, seek help. And I think, but I also think part of that came from, you know, in the cancer world, like, I think they focus on getting you physically well. And I think a lot of times they forget that emotional and mental piece. Mm -hmm. And it's not because the doctors are wrong or, you know, not thinking about it. I think the doctors, you know, they're doing their job. Their job is to make sure that, you know, you're getting to a point where there's no evidence of disease and physically mm -hmm. you're doing well. But I think holistically, they forget that mental piece. Mm -hmm. And I think that also, I think for a lot of years, you know, if you said you're struggling emotionally or mentally, even in the workplace, um, or just in society, there was this negative stigma around it. And so I think yeah. that piece was hard to say, hey, I need help with just my day-to-day -day stuff, but I also need help where I need to have someone help me talk about these things. And how do I sort of process all this stuff that has just happened to me? Um, and then how do I sort of, you know, work on the guilt piece Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and understanding that it's not a reflection of me and it doesn't, it's, you know, it's, it's okay to feel guilty about things. It's human nature. Um, and so I think, you know, being able to talk to someone and seeks, you know, um, I think, you know, going to therapy and, you know, doing all those things has been really instrumental for me in just being able to sort of talk about some of those things that happened yeah. and then also talk about how do you cope with it, like developing like coping skills and strategies. Um, and then I think another huge piece for me was finding things that I, that help like relieve my stress. Like, you know, just knowing mm -hmm. that, you know, like if I take a yoga class, I feel great, you know? Mm -hmm. If I'm outdoors in nature, that helps me and understanding what helps you sort of cope and what's your sort of peaceful place to sort of, you know, prioritize and think about these things or even take a break from those things. Mm -hmm. Because we live in a society that I think even now, um, even though there have been improvements, I still hear it and see it and I cringe when you are applauded for being yes. nonstop. Mm hmm. And yeah. I think especially during um, the pandemic, yeah, when it was when when we were the shelter in place and and when a lot of people worked from home for you know I mean I never stopped working from home, but um, but there was a lot of I think social guilt on social media where people would say oh well you have no excuse so now you can just go, 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 yeah. go. And it's just applauded and there's no concern or um, just really a focus on you can get burned out and yeah. you need to have some space and some grace for yourself. So what are the indicators for you that um, you need to make sure that you are practicing your wellness with all of your coping skills and yeah. relaxation? to really be well? Well, I think for me, it's when I start to get irritable, I notice like, you know, like, I, or when I can't sleep too, like I, because I may be up at night and I'll be thinking, oh, I didn't get to this. I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, and, you know, oh my goodness. Yeah. I forgot to do that for the kids. You know, oh, this project is due for work. And, you know, have I done enough to, you know, am I a good place, you know, and it's, if it's due in a couple of days, I think when I, it starts to impact my sleep, mm -hmm. um, or it just impacts my, I think my emotions, I think I get irritable. Like I, I can see myself sort of just like, Oh, like, you know, and then I have to check myself. <laughs> I have to say, wait a second. And I have to be honest and say, you know, like, it's not like, you know, if it's my kids or if it's my husband, I have to say, it's not you. 
Mm -hmm. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. I think it's hard to do that, to take accountability for that sometimes is you just react. And I think sometimes I have to know that those are indicators that I have to take a break. Um, I got to slow down or I have to set, you know, boundaries with that particular portion Mm -hmm. or that I have to say, look, it's okay if it didn't get done. You know, at the end of the day, if, you know, if this hasn't gotten done, nobody's died. (laughs) Everything's okay. (laughs) Everybody's still functioning. Everyone's happy. And I also think that it's taught me to lower my expectations. Like Mm. really, because I think we all have expectations sometimes. And I think we set them so high that when you don't Mm. meet them, it's like, you know, so I've learned that, you know, having lower expectations is okay. It's okay to not say, I'm going to be the best at everything, or this is going to be amazing. It's just like, and then setting goals that are attainable for myself. I, especially as a cancer patient, I don't set long-term goals. Mm -hmm. I set very short goals. Like I said, like, you know, my son now is in ninth grade. I wanted to make it till he made it to middle school graduation. Mm -hmm. And now I'm like, okay, now I want to make it to, you know, to high school graduation. And I'm, you know, before I used to think I want to be here for their weddings. I want to be here for this or that. But I, I have to be realistic with myself because I think if, when I think that I won't do those things, it's emotionally very hard for me. Mm -hmm. So I have to say, you know what, let's take it one step at a time. Mm -hmm. Let's set Mm -hmm. these small goals a couple years out. Let's see how this goes. If I make it there, that's going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. But I've had to learn to sort of lower my expectations and just set smaller goals for myself. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, I think that is so powerful. That is very powerful and it can be a message for the loved ones of cancer um, patients as well Yeah, that you may be putting on um, more pressure, unintended pressure and anxiety by telling somebody, oh yes, you're going to be here for, you know, in 30 years, 40 years, X, Y, and Z. And while you may mean well or not may, you mean well, but being mindful of what, um, how that's impacting the person that you're talking to. Yeah. I think that's so true. Cause I know, I think it's hard because nobody, when you have an illness or you're struggling with something, I mean, people, unless you've been through it, and even when you've been through it, you sometimes don't know how to say things or say the right mm-hmm. things you want to help. Exactly. And it's, and I think it's hard for people, right. And it's uncomfortable, mm-hmm. right. You know, my family jokes about it because we, we joke about things that are probably inappropriate, but we need to find some humor in what's mm-hmm. happening. Um, and I also think that we also, it's a way for us to communicate about it and talk about it. But I think we mm-hmm. also have learned that mm-hmm. we have to find the positive and the good in small things. Um, you yeah. know, like, you know, it's funny because I hear so many people say, oh my gosh, I got, I'm, I'm pushing 50 or, you know, it's another birthday. And I think in my head for me, it's like, gosh, I can't wait to push 50. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited. You know, every year I get a birthday, I'm so thankful. You know, I'm like, I want to have wrinkles. I want to look, you know, I want to wait for that. Or, you know, like if, um, we get, you know, a diagnosis, you know, and maybe I realize, you know, my treatments aren't working the way they want to work. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's okay because, you know, we, we still have, we still have each other and that's, you know, and we knew, we know these things are going to happen or, you know, mm-hmm. things are going to come up and we, we learn to sort of find the positive and everything. And it makes me um, really appreciate the time I have with people now. Mm-hmm. I don't think I did that. I think I think we live in a world where everyone it's instant gratification with social media. It's instant gratification, like moving, moving, moving so quickly that we don't appreciate little things. And, you know, I think we also, it's funny because, you know, my husband and I are always saying how um, I'm big. He always says, I'm always planning a lot of things. And I plan a lot of things, I think, because I not so big on like leaving, you know, like, doing all the commercial materialistic things with my kids, Mm -hmm. but I want them to have memories. Like when Mm -hmm. I, if I leave, like, what are those memories going to be? And so I appreciate like those kinds of things so much more now. So even if like something happens and it's like ridiculous, like the other day at the house, like, you know, if I, if I like, you know, slip and spill a jar of ketchup or something, (laughs) 
I'm laughing about it because I think, you know, Mm -hmm. it sucks. I'm going to have to clean all this up and do this. But at the same time, that's a memory that my kids are going to have where, oh my God, mom went sliding across the kitchen on ketchup Mm -hmm. and it was hilarious. So it's little things that I think that are seem so bad or seem horrible that I find humor in, or I try to make sure that we find the positive in them so that, you know, those are things that we're going to remember long after we're gone. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of those, um, just those, just the wisdom, the wisdom, the insight, uh, and this conversation could go on forever and ever and ever. Um, like I said, when we started off, we would talk forever and ever and ever. And I'm glad that you have continued to be able to make memories over the last 13 years. Oh, thanks, Constance. And I'm so proud of you. I want to tell you, like, I mean, the stuff, you know, the work that you do and everything you're doing, I really am. I just, you know, it's, it's, it's great to see people grow and then to see where they end up. And so, you know, watching, you know, everybody that, you know, through the years, like sort of end up where they're at. It's amazing. And it means a lot to me. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I know that this conversation will help so many people and just will help families, help survivors, help. Yeah. It's going to help so many people. So oh, thank thanks, you Constance. and continue to be well and practice well. Thank wellness. you. Thank you.